Hey, Hal here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, our partnership with Onyx Hunt. Um, I've been using it for a while now, and if anybody knows me, they know I'm not a very techie person, but the Onyx app is really, it's a real time saver. I remember the days when we poured over topo maps everywhere we was going to go and stuff, and I don't, uh, I don't do that quite as much anymore. Where it's really helped me is, is uh, scouting, you know, whether it's deer scouting, a moose, or even turkey hunting in the spring, which I do. It, uh, it really helps out. I don't have to spend as much time running around the truck, burning up the gas. I, uh, I'm just basically using my Onyx. Got it on my phone. Don't even carry a GPS anymore. So uh, I just download the areas where I'm going to be hunting, whether it's up north moose hunting. And, and uh, I use it mostly on the uh, satellite imagery. I like to see the, the cuts and the clearings and the turkey hunting, the hidden fields and stuff. But uh, everybody's using it now from the game wardens to, the, to uh, land surveyors and, and uh, just a great tool. And uh, with our partnership with with uh, Onyx, if you use a code BWB, you're going to receive 20% off on your first premium or elite memberships. And you just go to onyxmaps.com slash hunt. You'll be glad you did. Good luck on the trail. This is the Big Woods Bucks Podcast. Come explore the big woods and timber in North America with your host, Maine Master Guide and Deer Tracking Expert, Hal Blood. Listen to Hal and co-hosts Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy as they unlock the secrets of Big Woods Whitetails. Each episode will provide valuable insights in the tried and true system Hal has used for the last 40 years to scout, locate, and hunt mature Big Woods Bucks. Listen and laugh as the crew discusses Hal's legendary adventures and learn how to apply a lifetime's worth of lessons from the big woods to your own hunting and outdoor adventures. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm your host, Hal Blood. And today we're sitting over here in Rangeley, Maine with, you'll never guess, Lee Libby. Howdy. Welcome back, Lee. Hey. A.K.A. Bad Lee. Good to be back. You've been yeah. busy. Yeah, I bet. Snowmobiling. <laughs> we had all kinds of concerned emails and comments wondering if you were yeah, still alive. Yeah. So he's alive and breathing and uh, everything's good. So me and Joe made the trip over today. And uh, today we've got a special guest from Minus 33, the owner of Minus 33 Wool, John Glidden. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're going to talk about not only the Minus 33, but we want to give people a little education on wool because we probably all need one. I mean, uh, you know, we've been promoting wool forever, but sometimes you got to hear it from the expert. And you've been in the wool business, would you say, 50 years? Uh, that's as long as I've been at it, but the family's been at it 116 years, so it's, yeah. been, it's been a while, yeah. All right. So we got a little history on wool going to talk about today. So what do you want to talk about first, John? I want to know. Wait, I had a question. Okay. Go to it. Go yeah. right to it. So when people think of wool, they think of that scratchy wool. We all got in boot camp, right? And, you know, the jackets. How did you come up with, like, that minus 33? Because I have all that gear, and it's it's not itchy. It's soft. It's warm. It's How did you make that transition from scratchy wool to? So, so there's two things that make that scratchy wool. And one is just the coarseness of the wool, and that depends on the different kind of sheep you raise in different areas and whatnot. And the fine wool generally comes from Australia or comes from other parts of the world, but generally it's Australian wool that's fairly fine. And then the second thing that you'll also notice with the, the minus 33 wool is it doesn't shrink. Now, it doesn't shrink because of a technology where we take the little scales that are on the wool fibers and we either break them off or we cover them up. There's a couple of different ways to do it. So that the wool no longer felts, which, you know, our old jackets we used to get and our old uh, Pendleton wool shirts that we had as kids, they, after seven or eight years, you couldn't put them on because the sleeves were too short. 
Mm-hmm. So now I we remember that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that beautiful shirt. You couldn't wear yeah. it. You know. Yeah. So the technology had advanced itself so that we can make it so it doesn't shrink. And when we do that, we also make the fibers a little softer. So we're getting a double whammy by buying super fine wools and then treating them to be shrink proofed. So that's why we got there. That's how we got rid of the the itchy scratchy stuff. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, we're getting an education, Lee. I yeah. see that already. <laughs> I wondered that too, and I always wondered why how you could have your your wool long underwear and throw it in the washer and dryer, and it's the same size. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the, the American public today, uh, they they won't buy something if they've got to do any kind of work to take care yeah. of it. You know, <laughs> right. it, it, you're not going to take it yeah. to, into a dry. And they last. Today. They last. I got a yeah. pair in the back room that's got to be four years old and. Yeah, you know yeah. they're worn out in all the right spots, but yeah, they yeah. still it's serviceable. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The stuff is the stuff is good, and it's uh, you know, like I said, we give a lot of credit to the technology that's out there in the in the industry today. But sure, yeah. I also didn't realize that different sheep from different parts of the world had different wool. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yeah um, you'll think of the English sheep as uh, carpet wool, uh, really big fibers and stiff and springy and you wouldn't even want to have a an overcoat made out of it and then yeah. like i say our australian sheep would get really fine the wool's almost fine as cashmere in some cases so this is a big variety huh that's very interesting yeah. yeah and you make it all right in the united states no we um the wool comes generally from australia and uh, we spin it then we make it then we knit it and then it's uh and we do that generally outside the U.S. Some of it's done in China, some in Vietnam. We've done stuff in Cambodia. We do stuff in, in Europe. And uh, so about half of our stuff comes from outside of China. Mm-hmm. We're desperately working to get more suppliers e- either locally here in the U.S. or outside of China. Um, but it's difficult. It's difficult because... The American public wants to pay so much for something, and they don't want to pay the extra money to have it. Well, they don't want to work for it. They don't want to work for it, yeah. (laughs) Nobody wants to work anymore, and they want all the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, we've been, we've kind of got brought into that slowly over the years that, you know, that's why all the companies I started going to China, because the labor was cheap and all that, so now everybody wants the cheap stuff, you know, so... I know I'm I'm getting finally trying to get away from it. It's hard. Sometimes you can't get away from it for certain reasons. They don't even make the stuff here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But we're trying like heck to, you know, yeah. buy but, stuff that's made in U.S., you know. Yeah. The one thing that we do make here in the U.S. is our uh, Mountain Heritage brand socks. Right. We, um, in uh, 2018, we built a, a small little sock making plant specifically to make high-quality socks, which we were just unable to source anywhere in the world, and we finally decided we'll just make them just the way we want them, the way we think they should be made. And uh, you've all had a chance to try yeah. them on and whatnot. And, yeah, yeah, they're great. It, is yeah. there a simple way to explain? Because I've, I've always wondered, so you shave sheep, right, to get the... <laughs> you <could> say, <laughs> so you got we, this we, pile we, of fiber. Yes. I've always wondered how that... <coughs> gets made into something that you can actually sew not sew but you know weave into something all right so that was uh two and a half years of my college education but i'll i'll, I'll crunch it down yeah <laughs> oh we've got an hour <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so basically we shear the sheep we call it not, yep. not shave them and we take that uh that fleece which is called greasy it's got a lot of lanolin on it and whatnot. And we'll take it and we'll scour it, we'll wash it all off. We'll take a lot of the seeds and burrs and stuff out of it. And then we'll, we'll take it and we'll run it through what we call a carding machine. And it basically straightens out the fibers. And from that point on, we have a, a, several different things we can do with it. But usually we'll run it through a Worcester combing system and make it into thin rovings, which will then spin into yarn. And depending on the fiber diameter and what your outcome is, it will spin real fine yarns or real coarse yarns if we're going to make, like, carpet yarns. And um, then you either knit or weave that product into your, into your fabric. So, like, your, uh, your jacket that you're making is made with a relatively coarse yarn, and then 
the fabric is felted up, where it's run through a fuller mill and soap and water and agitated and it shrinks. Then they treat that afterwards to try to slow down the shrinkage. Um, in our case, the fiber is treated before it's spun so that it won't shrink, and then we spin and. So the the merino was treated for, first. Is it, it? It's washed and scoured. Right. Then it's treated. So then you, then we yeah. spin it. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so the so the stuff the weaving in the coats and stuff that was what was interesting to me because you see a lot of different wool and we've over the years we've been in our coat and jacket you know our pant business for quite a few years now ten more than ten years I guess and there's a lot of variation in wool we found I remember when we first started and did our first packs we used some. Uh, recycled wool they called it i think reground is another word for it and it doesn't last it's cheap it's cheaper but it doesn't last yes yeah, so there's a uh, there's a whole menagerie of things that we do to recycle fiber uh, which is a good thing by the way to recycle it and make it into something else um, but if you too if you use too much of that short fiber it just falls out in the garment form at some point so, right. Um, and so, in the in my old days before we started minus thirty three, we ran a woolen mill where we made you know a couple million yards of fabric just like what you're using in in a variety of weights. We're like from twelve ounces to thirty ounces per yard, and we dyed it and finished it. So that's what I was really brought up making was that that very coating fabric that you're using right. now. Yeah. 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 So that that's the weight. I never knew that. So when when we hear an eighteen ounce say on our thin jackets, that's the weight per yard. Weight per yard, and okay, and and it's a yard of fabric, sixty inches wide. Right. So okay. it's really a yard and two thirds. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Square. Yeah. 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 If if it's something other than that, it'll be quoted as square yards or square meters. And so we started talking a little bit. I asked you about. Um, a hat that we had looked at that's melton wool. So merino wool is the type of sheep, correct? Yes. yes. Is melton the same thing? It's a different, same, it's a, it's, different type of sheep? It can be. It can be. So melton is, a, is generally a heavily fulled piece of cloth. So we weave it relatively loosely, and then we wash it and agitate it in, in what's called a fuller mill, we, and we shrink it up. And if you shrink it a lot, you tend to call it a melt. That so is, that when you shrink it like that, it probably tightens the weaver yes, up? Yes, yes, yep. it tight, tightens the weave up. When we, when we weave that kind of stuff, you can almost take your fingers and pull the fibers or pull the yarns apart and see right through it. But by the time we've uh, felted it up and shrunk it, you, can, you can't do anything like that. You can't even see the yarns. Right. Yeah. It's, like, it's more like smooth feel, looking and feeling. Yes, yep. yes. Yep. 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 Hmm. Interesting. So... So the long yarn, the, like it, what we call uh, virgin wool, right? Yes. That's, that's what we're using in our jackets. That's what they call it, virgin wool, because it's got the lanolin, I guess, still in it. Plus it's, not, it's got the long fibers, right? All right, so the, the virgin wool doesn't quite mean that. Uh, the lanolin's not in it. We've already scoured all the, the lanolin and taken the burrs and seeds out of it. It's just... Wool that has not been woven or worn before. I got you. All right. So we haven't made it into anything, basically. So Okay. So I was always under the assumption that the lanolin was left in it because that's what makes it more waterproof or water-resistant. No, no. But most of the lanolin is gone. So uh, it's the weave, the tighter weave, that keeps it from wetting through. It's a tighter weave, and then the, it, it also can be a finish or a product that's put on it, and... Uh, you probably, at the mill you're using now, they're probably putting something on that helps shed the, those oh. first few drops of water in a rainstorm. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. Hmm. Yeah. See? Yeah, because they eventually get wet. They're eventually going to get but wet. But they stay warm. So what's the, what's the science behind that? Okay, so in our wool fibers, we have a lot of, inside the fiber, we have a lot of open spaces and air pockets, basically. And as you know, air is an insulator. And even though wool gets 
soaking wet. You can pick it up and wring it out. It still has got lots of air in it. And that's where a lot of your warmth comes from. Mm-hmm. So that's the secret. Yeah. Yeah. That's why when you ride it, a snowmobile and you got your wool jacket on, the wind howls right through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the one downfall in, in the wind. It isn't as good. But I've noticed if you've got a, like our jackets, they're 22 ounce or whatever, they're pretty good even in, you know, I wouldn't say snowmobiling, but, you know, if you get out in a open country in a cut or something hunting, you know, you're not going to feel the wind blowing through it really. Yeah, the curse the curse of the windbreaker is that whatever windbreaker you put on usually makes noise when you're in the woods. So, oh, yeah. And, yeah. and nobody wants that. So, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. yeah. And, and a liner, <clears throat> liners to me just make them too hot. Right. You know, if you put that the liner on the inside for the windbreak. Yeah. And it, yeah. you can't breathe, you know, you you get sweated up, lathered up. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a happy median with people because everybody hunts differently. And I mean, you know, we talk about tracking a lot and you don't, you just don't dress heavy anyways. You move and you don't need to be too warm. But the thing about the wool also is that it's breathes, right? It's got air in it. So it breathes and it lets your, uh, you know, some of your heat out through it. Let some heat out and, and lets moisture out. Right. So because of those air pockets that are in the fibers, it'll absorb water very fastly. And it'll also expel it and let it out of the, the fabric fast. So you won't get sweat up. If you've got a cotton wool shirt on and you're really, you know, you're really dogging it and you're, you really are sweating, you just stop for a few minutes and that'll dry right out. If you've got your, uh, your cotton or even your synthetic undershirt on or whatnot, the thing's going to stay wet until you get home that night. And yep. that, that's the big curse of the synthetics and the cotton. Right. Yeah. That's why you wear your merino underneath and you don't have the problem. But yeah. I noticed even years ago, you know, I, from the time I started guiding deer hunters, you know, I was always, I never sweat much anyways, but I'd notice some of the the guys that did sweat, if it was a a cold day, I'd look at the back of their jacket would be all, look like frost on it. And that must be what you're talking about. The moisture went out through and was frosty on the back of their Jackets Absolutely. and their sure, shoulders. Sure. They, I got it. I they, never knew. Well, I figured it was sweat, but I didn't know that it was. The jacket itself wasn't really wet. It just wicked it right through. Wick, wicked it right through. Yeah, you might even be able to feel the inside of that jacket and say, "Hmm, it's still dry." And then yeah, you look at the right, outside. Right. But uh, those that would have been a, a fairly cool day. That, right. That kind of thing happened. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's interesting. So, so product wise, we know you have the socks and the. The, the uh you know long underwear and and hats um are you guys basically staying in that lane or are you expanding into other products or we're 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 always looking and poking and prodding the marketplace to see where where we should be going and uh in fact this fall we're coming out with a with an old product that we used to make which is this uh, uh green and black wool check shirt which is 17 ounces and um, we made that 10 years ago, and we ran into uh, uh, minimum problems on the order, as you guys run into sometimes on your products. Right. Um, so we finally just got big enough so we can now just make a big, nice big bite, and we're going to make that in the, in the green and black and uh, in the red and black checked, and we'll also make it in a solid gray. And that'll be our that'll new... That'll be nice. You know, and that's, that's our entry into really true outerwear. Yeah, um, we might have to logo some of them up with big woods, huh? We you, we can do that. Uh, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a nice looking shirt I see there. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember when I was a kid. That was a long time ago. Like, <laughs> like us old guys, right, John? Yeah. John's like, don't throw me into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, I'm I'm the senior here. You what? I'm the senior. You are? Yeah. <laughs> How old are you? 1955. Oh, yeah. you got two years on me. Yeah, yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> well, you remember. You look a lot younger than Hal. That <laughs> he's, he's definitely got more hair than me. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, yeah, we used to go to, I always went, I lived around the Portland area, so we'd run up to L.L. Bean, of course. You know, that's where you got sure, your hunting sure. stuff, yeah. my boots. and yeah. But they had a green checkered shirt that I used to always 
wear them and it was good. You could wear it in the summer any time of year, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, that's the shirt I wear almost all winter. Yeah. And even if it's, it's got to be well below zero before I'll give that up. So what I do is I layer. I'm a big guy, big fan on layering wool especially. And yeah. I'll just put on a couple more layers. And in fact, I, I carry that shirt in, um, I, w- I take a large, but I, I have an extra large and I have a double X large. So it depends on how much I put on <laughs> underneath it. depends on oh, yeah. which, which one I put on. So yeah. Good plan. Yeah, yeah. And layer, layering's really good because if you take it off, you can cool right down. Yeah. yeah. But the, the old one-time um, jacket that, that had all, all-inclusive, you know, big old heavy Johnson woolen jacket, you know. I remember them. You know, they, they, they were good, but. Boy, when you when you wanted to oh, cool yeah. off, you were buggered. Yeah, you know? I remember some of them back when that had, you know, they were a nice wool jacket, and then they had like a sheepskin liner in them yeah. and stuff. And I mean, they were great for sitting, but you didn't want to walk very far with one of them. Yeah, and the other thing is when when that big heavy jacket did get wet, and you'd Way come out of the time. woods, you'd be yeah. you'd be beaten, and you'd go and take that off and drop it on a kitchen floor in the water. <laughs> yeah. you know, it just, yeah. I lugged that around all day. My God, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I've been a proponent of a wool baseball style hat for a while, and we, we can't find a good one. We've looked and looked for one. Number one, that would be blaze orange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Stormy Cromer has theirs, but that's not a true, it's a good hat, but it's not a, true like baseball style hat is that something that minus 33 (laughs) might look at down the road we we've been unable to find a good wool baseball cap we've uh we used to or the used to make a lot of them in this country and for some reason you just can't find them i mean uh we would we would have one with a with our logo on it if we could find a good vendor that would that would make a good product for us there i found this one here in alaska was up on a shelf and I go, that looks like a wool hat. It was in uh, Talk Eatna in a little yeah, yeah. gift shop there. Yeah. So that's why I bought this one. Yeah. I'll have to show you the, it's made in the U.S., so I'll have to show you the tag on it. Maybe you can get with them about All right. Yeah, ones. I'd love to. This one's green. Love, but love to find them. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. The other, the other thing guys were asking about, and, and um, it might be something well, we could do. I don't know if you could make it or not or whatever, but is a they used to have these, what do they call them? Is it a pork pie hat or something? Joel Carvel likes them anyways. Oh, they got the crusher hat. Yeah, it's like a crusher, but it's it's a wool. You know, it's got the brim all the way around it. A lot of the guys really like that. And, and Beagleware made those some for back in the beginning. And people still ask about those. You know, like in, I think they made it with the green check and the orange on it too. It's a green, it's, red, yeah, Mike, orange. Mike Stevens has one. I think it's green and black check on the brim. Really? And then yeah. orange on top. Yeah. So it's legal for your orange. Le- le- legal orange. Yeah. yeah. Uh, boy, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen that product, but uh, I'll set my team to take a look, look at it anyways. Yeah, we can't yeah. find anybody that makes them, in, but, but there's a market for them, it seems like. You know, we have people ask all the time about them and stuff and i think people would buy them might be another thing it's you know yeah. you got to buy yeah. ten thousand of them I, to get them you know yeah. i found yeah. one at, and it, it i found le bonville has a crusher an orange crusher which i picked up but it's more it's like wool but i cut you call it like a felt hat more oh yeah which is it's soft and quiet and everything so, so it's but, a it was it wool felt or just just look like a felt hat. Um, right there, yeah. Lee's showing her. That's the hat right there that I have. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, like for me, that would be just for rainy days, you know, when it's dripping hard. Yeah. And, That's a felt you know. crusher. We used to wear them again when I was a kid. That that was a popular hat. Green. They had red. Mm-hmm. I don't think. Yep. I had one of them. I had a green one and a red one. I'd wear the red one in the fall and the green one in the summer and stuff, fishing or whatever. I mean. It, that was the hat back in the day. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But they're uh, they're not cheap. I forget exactly what it was, but I remember. I think it was thirty nine bucks. Thirty, but yeah, I was going to say thirty or forty bucks for it. But yeah. you know, it's worth it if yeah. it works. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it is true. Like 
Would you call felt is not woven? It's just pressed into a material or something? Right. So, so in that case, we would run it through what I spoke about earlier, the carding machine, and we would just lay that down as a thick web, maybe a couple inches thick, and then we'd, what we use called needle punches, we'd poke a bunch of holes in it, and uh, then we wash it and shrink it, and we just keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking it till we get that piece of felt. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, you can you can felt stuff. Uh, that's what your piano keys are made out of. It's felt that they felt the living daylights out of it to make it an inch thick. But we can make it an eighth yeah. of an inch thick like that crusher. Really? So, yeah. Wool, wool's very versatile. We can do a lot with wool. Yeah. The way those hats are made, those crushes is it's just like molded. They must wet it, put it on a mold, sure, and yeah. shrink it to that mold, and then it just hardens up that way. It's there's no like seams in. It. It's not sewed together or anything. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's um, like I said, wool very versatile. Yeah. Mm. yeah. In the in the process, so in looking for, you know, the blaze orange, the wool hat or whatever, in the coloring process, is that something where you've got to find, you know, someone's got to be making like these large amounts amounts of blaze orange and coloring at that, or is that something that's done later on in the process? Okay. So there's 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 two ways we we color the products that you buy. The first way is we, we can dye the fiber or we can dye the yarn. And uh, for our products, usually it, it's a dyed fiber. And then we make the yarn, and then you got your blaze orange okay. hat or whatever. The other way, which is probably like your cape, the, your blaze orange cape or whatever, is we weave and finish a piece of grayish fabric, which would be kind of white, and then we have the fabric finished, and then we dye it to the right. color of choice. So you, you might buy so much orange, so much blue, so much green, and then you'd have your, your, your fabric that way. Yeah, that's the way they do it, because I know when we <clears throat> order it there, sometimes it's already, like you said, it's, it's white checkered, Yep. and then they dye it green for us. Right. That's just the way this green one that I've got here today was made. And, yep. Uh, and then you can dye one piece blue, blue black, one green black, one red black, whatever colors you want. Right. It's a it's a very efficient way of of getting a variety of colors without have to having a whole mill turned upside down. Right. Yeah. Seems to work pretty good, but we're we're finding out a lot about this wool and this <laughs> process we started over again here. <laughs> it's like you think you just pick up the phone and say, hey, I need another 500 yards of wool. It doesn't really work that way, does it? No, no. <laughs> like, if they have some made there that they can dye, it's not bad. It's like they, they tell us it's like a six-week to two-month deal. Yeah. If it's they got to make, if they don't have it there, they have to source the yarn and then make it and yeah. then dye it. And that's a f- yeah, four to six five month process for us so we got to think ahead now a lot more we're, right. we're we're in the learning curve here right right your your mill is actually buying the fiber right buying the fiber then making the yarn then we, weaving the fabric then finishing it then dyeing it and then shipping it out yeah and uh, in the meantime they've probably got some other customers they got to take yeah. care of too you know <laughs> yeah well, guys that ordered ten thousand yards <laughs> instead yeah. of a hundred yards you know yeah, yeah. well it ain't no hundred yards okay I think, we, I think we have a minimum order i think it's 440. 440. It's, it's eight rolls. Eight rolls, yeah. They put 55 yards on a roll. Yeah, we'd call that a set. Yeah. It's a set of eight. That would well, be. That's the minimums. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. there probably was a time not that long ago when you could just call up and get wool. Yeah. Not that long, but it's just the demand probably isn't. You know, everything was made of it back then. Now there's all the synthetic stuff that took its place. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the woolen industry, which is. Uh, the industry I grew up in, which is the fabric that you're talking about, uh, there used to be hundreds of woolen mills in New England, hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, slowly the synthetics and the other competitive products just sort of ate that whole industry up. I mean, it's it's a shadow of what it was yeah. in the 60s. And it's really a shame because none of it's any better than wool. They all, when they were coming out with the hunting clothes with the camos and these different materials, their claim to fame was with just like wool only better you know and and, and it's not it mm, might yeah. be just like wool but it's worse you know yeah yeah it yeah. either isn't as quiet it's it's not as warm it's it's none of it's warm when it's wet you know that's exactly right and yes. uh 
but they had a lot of good marketing. A lot of, a lot of marketing dollars behind the, the yep. guys at DuPont and those, those, yep. those big guys. They just had to, had yep. to sell a story. You know? yep. And then uh, I come back to the recycling part about it. That old wool jacket, if you took it to the Goodwill shop, it would eventually get recycled into another wool product. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, and that's why when we talked about that was it was, and they still do it. It's it just isn't the material doesn't stand up the recycled type wool. It, right, you need to use it for a different type of a thing. Right, but like, you can't when if you try to make it into a pair of pants or a jacket, it's not going to last. It's, it's 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 not going to last. We we would make that into uh, into a into a felt like uh, sound absorbing yeah. products that are in the hood of your car or or. There used to be boot liner felt that was all recycled yeah, yeah. wool hmm. and those type of things. Well, you could make a blanket out of it, something sure, that doesn't sure. take a lot of wear or anything. But yes, in fact, minus thirty three, we we do sell a um, a check blanket that is uh, some of it is a recycled product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine for that, but not in yeah. clothing. No, no. no. It, um, uh, so, so when I was over uh, in Vermont <clears throat> a few years back, I noticed there was a lot more farms up on the hillsides a lot of a lot more field, you know woods that were converted to fields and stuff were, was there a lot of sheep farming back then is that what a lot of that was yeah yes, and, and, uh, so um in the 1700s up until like the 1820s um most of central new hampshire and vermont were all sheep farms that was that's what built all those old you know early 1800 uh churches and big town halls that are all made out of uh you know, cut granite and stuff. It was all sheep farmers that built hmm. all those places. Oh. And then the boys discovered that out west they had fields with no rocks. And <laughs> <laughs> Everybody jumped ship and went to Ohio. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I imagine that <clears throat> the bulk of sheep farming's elsewhere now, I would think. Yeah, so, so just a quick little history on sheep farming in the U.S. Uh, we raise most of our sheep in the U.S. for meat. And uh, the goal of the farmer is to raise, get twins and uh, twin lambs and raise them up. And that's what, what drives our industry. And the quality of the wool is secondary. So most of American wool is coarser, not super fine. The Australians, on the other hand, raise their, most of their sheep for wool. And they're happy getting a single lamb that's super fine, really nice. They'll keep that sheep alive for many years and shear it dozens of times and they produce their wool so that's why the australians have the finer wool and uh the americans we have the coarser wool so so it's a genetic thing the f- oh the sure, fine? sure sure okay yes yeah. so merino goes back into um, spain in the 1400s it was merino sheep which was super fine and eventually they got taken out of Spain and then tramped all over the world and wound up in Australia and crossbred and whatnot for different reasons. You raise different sheep, and like I say, the English, they have very tough countryside, so the, those real delicate merino sheep, they didn't survive there, so the uh, English got these real coarse, long-haired, pretty ugly-looking things myself. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it just kind of diversified hmm. itself. Hey, Hal here. Just wanted to tell you we're excited about uh, our partnership with Minus 33. Minus 33 specialized merino wool base layers for outdoor enthusiasts. From tops and bottoms to hats, socks, gloves. And our gear is going to keep you warm and comfortable no matter what adventure you're on. Especially those big woods ones. We're a fifth generation family owned and operated. A New Hampshire wool and textile manufacturer. They have over 106 years of wool and expertise. And they started manufacturing woolen socks, the Mountain Heritage ones, in New Hampshire in 2018 with the idea that a quality product, affordable pricing, and can be worn and loved from season to season. No matter what uh, your experience level or skill is, so no one should feel uncomfortable or ill-prepared in the outdoor community. Having a reliable gear is one of the first steps towards a lifetime of passion or whatever activity it is. And my caveat to that is, is you got to wear your woolies. Cotton is death. Hey, Hal here, and I want to tell you about Spearfish Forest Products. They're still hiring for skilled labor. They filled some of the other positions, but they're particularly looking for millwrights, electricians, and saw filers. And the locations for these would be 
Spearfish Forest Products in Spearfish, South Dakota, and Montrose Forest Products in Montrose, Colorado, a division of Neiman Enterprises. Same benefits. they got access to public land available for all outdoor activities. They're doing sign-on bonuses. There's free health care for employees and families, 401k with a company match, and also relocation assistance. So anybody interested in moving and you have any of those skills, you can contact John Fennelson at 307-760-7907 or email hr at neiman, N-E-I-M-A-N dot com. And their website is neimanenterprises.com. Hope you get a position and enjoy it out west. As you all know, Big Woods Bucks is devoted to promoting the best equipment for tracking and still hunting the Big Woods. Part of that equation for success is the sights that sit on your hunting rifle. We've chosen Skinner Sights as the company to produce our custom-built BWB Tracker Series peep sight. It's constructed of solid steel, has our custom ghost ring, and was co-developed by some of the best trackers in the world. To get yours, go to bigwoodsbucks.com and click on the optics. So the merino wool, the merino name is actually comes from a merino sheep. Sure. Yes, so there was a merino sheep, and now there's all kinds of different names. But generally in the public today, it, it just means soft wool. Right. Merino wool is soft wool. Uh, there's no legal definition of it today but right yeah huh. yeah i'm interesting i never knew that about sheep and <laughs> yeah. all the never really stopped to think about it much but. of course you didn't you didn't go to college for three years for <laughs> yeah <Mike John. laughs> i don't know he went that long i mean he just told us everything <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so uh yeah that was uh quite a shock for a 18 year old uh guy from central new hampshire a little kid that just liked to go out in the woods and go hunt to go drop downtown philadelphia <laughs> jumping jesus wasn't that a shock <laughs> yeah yeah but, uh, got, so got my engineering degree and got the hell out of there <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so it was something that you you knew you were going to go into or you were yes yes by the time i got to college age i was like I'd, I'd worked in the mill summers with worked on the maintenance department, which was shocking. Uh, but yeah, I'd worked in every department, so I had an idea what was going on. And then when I went to college, I would work summers, and I was always drafted for the worst possible jobs. And <laughs> <laughs> the, the maintenance crews loved to stick me in ugly black holes and dig muck out of things. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think the reason the the I, I would think there would be more woolen mills. Like now, I mean, for us, it was hard to find wool after, like Woolrich, I think, was like the last big holdout, right? Woolrich so, made it. So, so Woolrich closed, unfortunately, um, a few years ago, as you know. But it's Pendleton Woolen is the, is the real woolen mill in, in, right. this, in this country today. And they are a... a modernizing and upgrading their plant and uh, yeah they they do a great job making making yeah that's good wool and and, uh, the other one is uh you got filson out in washington and they've been around since the 1800s or something right but they're 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 just a garment maker they're just a garment maker Okay, they yeah. don't make wool. They make wool. We, we, we've done business with them. In fact, uh, I hope I'm not telling any trade secrets, but we used to make the long underwear for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for, for quite a few years. Yeah. yeah. I uh, thought they was a woolen mill, too, but they just, they just make the products. They just, they just uh, make the products and make the beautiful, beautiful catalogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get an idea of what you want to pay for a jacket. You just go through there and find a nice jacket that's 440 bucks, and you say, I oh, mean, I can buy that for 220 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just cut the price in half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I actually, I back when I was getting my stuff at Beans, they had they started carrying the Filson pants there, and I would buy them because they were rugged. You know what I mean? They yes. were they were yep. tough. Oh, they make good product. No yeah. doubt about it. You you get something good when you empty I think, your wallet. Yeah, I think back in the eighties, I think a pair of pants there was oh, they were over a hundred dollars back in the eighties. But sure. they would last four years at least, you know, and I went through a lot of raspberry bushes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like the, I, I did that because the, the Johnson ones would be a one year deal. You know, you buy them for thirty five dollars or something, but you bought another pair because they were so thin in the front after one year that too much of that short fiber in there. Yeah, and yeah. then you had to, <laughs> yeah. you know, they wet right through. You know, they'd wet right through if you were in a good dew or something in the bushes. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I started with them Filsons and. Yeah. And uh, they were good. Yeah, they're, they're good money. But Yeah, I can't say anything bad about the quality of that product. The no. Filson, Filson today still makes makes really yeah. nice stuff. Yeah. yeah. But they yeah. do have good marketing, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Where I was going with that was I would, I would think, and then with our experience now about trying to find the wool that we did, that there would be room for more mills. But you don't, do you think that's the case or not? Well, the unfortunate part about a woolen mill is it's such a monstrous undertaking that you just almost impossible to start another one. Oh, okay. When they go, they're gone. That's that's it. So I got you. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. The only yeah. way for another one to start would be the demand. If there was a lot more demand, you know. Yes, I'm, I mean. I'd, I'd, like love, I'd love to build another plant. You know? yeah. <laughs> show, show me a piece of ground and you know, give me a hundred million bucks. I'll build. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It takes a long time to get a hundred million bucks back. Yeah, you? <laughs> that's, that's a lot right. of socks. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of socks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and even the 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 machines like. A card machine? Do they even have places that make card machines anymore? Sure, sure. We yeah. can buy we can buy brand new ones out of Italy. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, and spinning machines. I mean, you know, you you can still get the stuff. Um, you know, there's just nowhere near as many people running it as there used to yeah. be. So, a lot of the old stuff just gone to the scrap pile. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, it's it's I'm just a situation. You know, with the synthetic markets out there, it's never going to change. They're always going to. Yeah. Yeah, they're always yeah. going to sell more synthetic than yeah, and and you know some guy's going to hunt what five or six days every fall, and he don't have a lot of money, and he's just going to spend a hundred bucks and buy some cheapo thing, and yeah. then it's going to sit in his closet for the whole year, and he's not going to pull it out and wear it again. Uh, you know, we're obviously you guys, you're 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 running your uh, winter gear every day all the time. You know, yeah. so uh, it's more of a yeah. lifestyle thing. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But um just to come back to the to the wool yarn side of things on our on our wool socks, we run um uh, a variety of yarns in the sock and uh we make a sock that you might at first look at it and say it it looks a little small. And um the uh, uh, what we what we do is we make the sock so that it's uh, got a lot of elastic in it. So it holds tight to your foot. So when you put it on and it has to fit right, and the heel has to fit your heel really nice, then you've got the right size sock. But that sock will stay on tight to your foot. So if you're hiking or going somewhere, your foot, as it slides up and down your shoe, which it does to some extent, it rubs the boot or your shoe against the sock, not your foot against the sock. Therefore, right. therefore it prevents the blisters. So as long as you've got a shoe that fits right, or a foot gear, boot, or whatever that's, that fits right, that's the, the product you want on your foot, and that's, then you can go all day. But goodness gracious, if you get a blister on a, on a, on a 10-day hunt in Alaska or something, yeah. you're done. you just yeah. got to hang it up and give it up, you know. So. Yeah. That's one th- I was telling them, guys, in one of the other podcasts, I noticed that I went to put the socks on when I first got them, and I'm like, I can't get these things on. I realized I had to pull it to the toe. You can't, like, pull it on like a regular sock. You've got to pull it up to your toe hits the end and then pull it around your heel. Right. So, the, so our socks are more, we'll call them athletic socks. They're more for the people that get out and do stuff. Yeah. It's where you really want it on your foot. For, for hikers and mountain climbers and AT guys, you know, that, that hike the AT and that type of thing, you know, they've got to have a sock that. They're not going to have to fiddle with all day. They just pull it on. It's going to stay on your foot, and it's going to it's going to be there all day. Uh, with those uh, ones that you just put on with with two fingers, and you say, "Ha, ah, it's on." That ain't on, you know. Yeah. It's going to slide all over the place. Yeah, and the other thing I noticed was, uh, I always liked the type of socks that had the, I call it, it looked like the towel inside. Terry. You know? yep. Terry. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
And uh, when I tried those expedition ones there, because that's what fits my feet the best to go in my combination sure, of my sure. boots. But, yep. Yep. but um, the ones I was wearing, after two days, I'd have to throw them in the washer, you know, especially, you know, if you go into camp, you're in a remote camp like moose hunting for a week, you got to take plenty of socks because you can't. I mean, two days is it. They're matted down, you know. Yeah. yeah. But I noticed with uh, your minus 33s, I could get – I wouldn't wear them more than three at home because, you know. Yeah, yeah. I worn them, you know. This probably stinky, but but I could get easily three days, and it never changed the the feel of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. They weren't matted down, and and because uh, when they mat down, they they're smaller. You know. Sure, sure. So I was uh, in Alaska a couple of years ago on a seven day hunt, and um, we we were we were way back in the middle of nowhere, just a guide myself. And at night, I'd take my socks off and put them in my sleeping bag. And in the morning, they'd be dry, and they'd fluff back up. Right. So you can, you can also do that, you know. It's a good you know. trick. A yeah. lot of people don't know about throwing yeah. stuff in a sleeping that's, bag. Yep. And it, I put all my clothes in a sleeping bag yeah. so they're it, warm in the morning. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Put your long johns down. Everything. Yeah. 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 But it, it's amazing. You, you'd say, well, how's that going to dry? It, it just does. Mm. Yeah. It dries, Heat. you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, that's a big, that's an important thing. Yeah. 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 Good. Good stuff. Interesting. Quite an education. Yeah. On wool. Yeah. That's a, it's it's great stuff. Yeah. I, I I wear it all the time, and I'm I'm a big fan of layering from the from the lightweight t-shirt right straight through to the, to the jacket and yeah. whatnot. And, yeah. and, I might have a pair of your socks on now. No, nope. sorry. Smart, no. <laughs> smart wool. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing. Good thing. Competition. I could, yeah. yeah. I get my heel. I'll step that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lee, I, where have you been? Uh, right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. I didn't hear hiding the hair for a month. I'm like, maybe there's something wrong over there. I'm thinking, oh, no, man. after there was something wrong, he'd call me or something. I go, I yeah. gotta call him. Something <laughs> wrong with me. All right. Yeah. Left a message. No answer. I was Call in Canada. Again. I was yeah. up there in Frenchville there. Yeah. Dinging around the woods. Yeah. Believe me, I've been outside plenty. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you have. <laughs> yeah. But the antler hunting this year is awful. Oh, yeah. Everybody's. I, I yeah. hardly see any pictures posted of yeah. guys getting moose antlers. Because they... I think they dropped them late, a lot of them. They did. They yep. got covered, oh, yeah. and then none of them were really in any roads too much. They mm-hmm. they seemed to – we were getting those little layers of crust, I think, and it kept them in the softwoods more. You know, they they weren't out running around the roads. But I can st- tell you they're not moving much right now. I'm no, going to start pounding are. it in two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah, I got to go to Canada next week, and then when I get back, I'm going to reposition. It's all play for you these days, isn't it, Lee? No, I mean, I got. I've made four phone calls this morning. That's <laughs> done my job. Wow. <laughs> no, it's this is my time of year. This is. This yeah, is I get it. I got three jobs on cruise control that don't need babysitting. Super smart guys and gals running the show, and you need any more help? Yep, you do always. Yeah, we just hired our nineteenth employee yesterday. All and right. we're trying to get to 25. You hear that? That's it. Here's yeah. your sales pitch. Yeah. Come work yeah. for a lease so he can play yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you're paying all. I can tell you, I have created some serious snowmobile addicts. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, now they're getting, you're getting them health insurance and everything now. Yeah. Huh? Holy smokes. Yeah. It's a pretty good place to work. Yeah. Health benefits are crazy. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I walked in and saw you knew your bikes out there. That, Intrigue me a little bit till you tell me the price tag on them. Yeah, but it's all, it's relative. Right? <laughs> it could be worse. The price of cocaine can't be much cheap right now either. You know? <laughs> I could be addicted to a lot worse shit. <laughs> yeah, but that is true. I like the motorsports pretty well. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anybody need a job? Want to move to Rangeley, huh, Link? You set them. Right yeah. Up. Well, that's the other thing is you know where do you live in Rangeley? Right. You know, if you can find something to buy. Don't you have some housing available? I do. Actually, I got one on the market. I just put one on the market. That was an employee housing project that didn't go. Yeah. You can't really employ your own house. Your, you can't really house your own employees because it gets weird. Like, 
if they're late on the rent or <laughs> you know they want to go i don't know it just was it wasn't what i thought it was going to be you almost better to just build like an old army barracks and say whoever wants to stay there can stay there yeah but no when they call in the middle of the night because the drains clogged and you scream at them get a f- plunger and <laughs> then their feelings get hurt and they go to HR and then HR calls you. And that's never, your that's never, you too, right? No. HR. No, no. They took me out of that HR <laughs> <laughs> They sent me to sensitivity training and I didn't pass. <laughs> so they took me out of the <laughs> training. I didn't honestly and then so they took me out of that position. But anyways. Oh, people boy. are sensitive these days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the merino wool, I got to put an order in. All right. <laughs> mine is 33. I got a lot of it, so. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I did. I just I came back from a trip the other day, and I got a bunch of your stuff. Did you? Good. And Good. it's old, and it's got holes in it, and so I yep. think I'm going to replenish my stock. Okay. You know you get a discount? I do. Oh, okay. That's why I'm going there, because I don't have no money. <laughs> <laughs> It's all out in the garage. (laughs) I can attest to that. Hey. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, it's been a good conversation, John. It's been great. Yeah, I appreciate you coming over. Thank Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, Yeah. we got our wool education. And uh, so anyways, get your minus 33 wool ordered up. Oh, I got to make an announcement that the next bunch of packs are out. So I think. They're coming, they're shipping them this week, so there'll be packs available again. Soon. Soon. I don't want to give a date. <laughs> Joe's cut me off at the knees. Soon. Because Liz does, a, Liz does the shipping and takes all the, the hate mail. So, But they'll, they're will they coming. They got them done, and then they're going to uh, they'll be working on jackets. I know people have been asking about when the jackets will be again. So that's coming. That's the next yeah. thing they're working on. and. And uh, they're working on the wool. We had to order, had more wool built for that. And uh, but that'll be, uh, you know, probably a couple, three more months, and we'll have them, and we'll finally be able to get on some kind of a schedule by learning how long it takes sometimes to get things. But yeah, so that's where that's at. Main guides banquet, but that's yeah. Well, I want to. We'll talk about that later, but. Um, Probably on the next one. Uh, no, I can mention it on this one too, just in case uh, it's timely, because that's that's kind of getting promoted a little later than usual. That's com- that's on April fifteenth, and uh, um, there's a guy, good friend of ours, Greg Lane. It's he's um, buying a rabbit tracker for the kids there, and uh, any of the kids that show up obviously with their parents because they get the kids can't get the gun but they're going to have a a drawing for one of the rabbit trackers at the guides banquet so a little incentive to get the get yourself there and your kids uh well that's about it as always hit the bell subscribe do the facebook youtube thing all of that stuff support all our sponsors and uh speaking of sponsors yeah. we we used onyx in an unconventional way today John, oh yeah, John couldn't find his way here, so we dropped the pin for him. Yeah, dropped the pin on Lee's driveway. Yeah, so yeah. anyone can use it, right, John? That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, John, don't forget to share that pin to everybody you know, so they'll know where Lee lives. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to that. Yeah, I'll put that on my Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. All right. Well, good enough. Until next time. Good luck on the trail. Hey guys, Joe here. Wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Lake Parlin Lodge. We're a uh, four-season lodge located just south of Jackman. We've got cabins, lodge rooms, mini lodge. We're a big snowmobile destination in the winter, full restaurant, bar, all the amenities that you need for your trip. Open all obviously through the summer right on the lake. Kayaks, canoes all included with the cabin. We also do a lot of weddings, so if you're looking for a destination wedding, we can do a wedding up to 200 people. And, uh, of course, We've got our hunting season, moose season, deer season. So check us out. We're at lakeparlinlodge.com. Hi, everyone. Team member Mark Sheeran here. I've been helping people solve their addictions for the last 34 years. In 2017, we published the revolutionary non-12-step book, The Freedom Model for Addictions. 
If you'd like a free paperback copy sent directly to you, go to freebook.freedommodel.org. That's freebook.freedommodel.org. All right, take care. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Till next time, good luck on the trail. 